for you to maybe take this dialogue organically and, and, and possibly go through some of the key highlights that I, I got from it, but anyone else as well. But uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. What an incredible movie. So thank you. No, thank, thank all of you. Thanks so much for having us. Um, it's, it's super exciting. And, uh, and so thank you all for, for taking the time to watch it. Um, truly started as a, a passion project. Uh, you know, our, my family had gone to Israel many times and I always just had loved the food so much. Um, and so, you know, we thought, you know, why not, uh, you know, why not start a search for, uh, you know, for the best food. And it was initially uh, 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 an exercise in finding the best shawarma. But what we found was shawarma was pretty boring. Um, everyone kind of agreed where it came from. You know, you have the different style meats. Um, and so then I started asking questions about hummus and things got more interesting. So um, it, it led us down an amazing uh, journey. Um, over a couple of years, I shot it. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, it's, it started as you know an hour and a half uh, film, and and over time we thought you know around forty five minutes was you know the best time for it, and um, you know I've been able to show it to a few festivals, um, and so um, yeah, we're really 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 proud of it. Um, you know, never thought it would uh, you know when you go into making a documentary, you have so many ideas of what it might be, and it turns into something you know, completely different, but, but uh, we're super proud of the, the final product. That's awesome. So I do have some questions I do want to ask. And then um, we'll, we'll, I know Judith just uh, set up a uh, text that she has a question as well, but let's go through some of those if that's okay. And then Alex, um, just some of the key words that I took from this, which was really neat. Maybe we can dive in a little bit after if that's okay with you. So yeah. the first one was, how did you choose the restaurants you visited? How did you select which ones who made the hummus? How did you select that? Yeah, so it was a variety of ways. First, um, you know, my personal experience um, of going to places uh, and then friend recommendations, people who lived there. And, um, you know, funny enough, everyone has their favorite hummus spot. So, um, we, you know, we got a lot of suggestions. And then while I was there, I hired um, local people in each city um, to, to not only pick their brain about the best spots, but also um, they would go to the, the restaurant the day before and kind of talk to them and explain what we were doing and see if they'd be open to it. You know, that way they weren't surprised with, you know, a bunch of cameras sort of, you know, bombarding their restaurants. So that worked out really well and only a couple places didn't want us to film. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we, we must have uh, I, I tortured my crew. We must have gone to 10 places every single day for, for many, many weeks. So we must have gone to over 50, you know, 50 restaurants at least. That, that was the second question. How many restaurants did you visit? So around 50, which was, that's incredible to, to be able to do that. Um, how large, so one of the questions was, how large was your crew, uh, your film crew? Yeah, so um, it was, it was me and then, um, two producers from LA that uh, we um, were friends with, had worked with before, and, um, you know, wanted to help support the project. Um, and, you know, were interested in the world and, and both hadn't been to Israel. Um, right. I, I, I was connected to a cinematographer um, who at the time um, just came off shooting a big movie actually um, and was available and was shooting a documentary in Africa and, uh, you know, wanted to come to Israel to sort of help us and see what we were doing. So um, it was him. And then I had a, a local guide as well, um, who sort of served as um, our guide and our driver and then a translator. Um, okay. and, and then, um, you know, any, you know, maybe one or two other people for sound um, or, um, you know, just, I, I had an extra guide when I went to the West Bank, but five, six people. Um, so pretty bare minimum crew. Excellent. So what is it, um, you look for in great tasting hummus? I mean, if there was one thing that you were just looking for, is there anything that just resonates? Um, you know, there, it's such a variety, um, cold, hot, plain, yep. uh, with meats, vegetables, um, you know, I like it spicy, um, okay. but you know, I, I certainly um, thought I knew a lot going in, but but I learned I learned a whole lot, you know, in the different styles and, and traditions. 
Um, you know, you can definitely tell when it's handmade versus machine made. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's really splitting hairs. It, it, it's so good there, you know, every place. So, um, you know, I'm open to a lot of different styles. So I'm going to default also to your dad, Rick. So hummus, you know, why, why, why that? And why would, would be that, that venture into, you know, this, this investment and opportunity for your son, which is phenomenal, by the way. So I was the one that <clears throat> originally wanted it to be shawarma because when I would go on missions to Israel and we would be out late at night, um, all the guys would search for the best shawarma places, not okay. just in Israel, but in, in other places that we took these Federation missions to. Um, and actually just as a quick aside, some of the best shawarma we found was in Warsaw, Poland, oh, but, really? uh, which was kind of interesting. But so um, Alex was talking to me about what they were discovering about hummus and that he thought hummus would be a better direction. And I said, no, I want a shawarma film. You know, I'm funding this, I want a shawarma film. So he said, okay. So they'd been out there filming for quite a while. And then I flew out to meet with them. Um, and I said, how's, how's, the, how's the documentary coming along? And he said, the hummus documentary is coming along great. So <laughs> better, great. Better, better to ask uh, forgiveness than permission, right? Right, right. So I, I think there's maybe be an additional story here, Alex and, and Rick. Father-son bond and the opportunity to connect, I mean, halfway across the world and, and you're doing this project, father-son and, and helping out. What would, we have a lot of grandparents uh, on the Men's Club. We also have uh, some younger parents with younger kids. I mean, what would be the lesson, a parental lesson for learning here with regards um, to, you know, backing and, and, and supporting your, your kids' dreams and stuff like that? So I think, um, I mean, Alex may have a different answer. For me, it came with the very first visit to Israel, which was in 95. And Alex was four years old, four and a half years old or something like that. Um, his sisters were a little bit older and, um, and just going there all together. And you hear this, so it maybe sounds a little bit corny, but as soon as we all got off the flight, we felt like we were home. Um, and so we just built off of that. And as Alex got older, we started going more often and um, we went as a family. I've been there just with Alex and his friends. And so um, it was just an amazing bond, a great way to build Jewish identity. Yeah. So some of the words I, I, I got from the, the documentary, crazy, love, astonishing, difficult, uh, unites the stomach, right? And all these, I mean, can, can we see food as a pathway to peace? in a way? I mean, can, can, can you envision that? Oh, I hope we can, but can you see it? it it's funny in a way. I mean, yes. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, despite all the craziness outside, you go into each restaurant and yes, I mean, the kitchen is crazy, but you know, everyone's there enjoying themselves. Um, you know, a lot of different backgrounds and religions. And I, you know, you find that at pretty much every uh, restaurant you go to there. And so, you know, it's just a funny thing to see. And then you step out in the world and things are a little different. Um, so, you know, I think there's something there for sure. Yeah. I would just add to that and say, you know, food can be a basis, but there are so many commonalities that we all have. And there's been a lot of discussion, even within Israel. Um, and there's talk of it, you know, by various candidates for, for the election that's coming up about, you know, investing in things that create that make people happier, that make their lives better and more fulfilling. Food's one of them, obviously, but there are other things that go into it. So I think, you know, if you could find ways to build those commonalities. I did see, there was a question that, about why we didn't go to Gaza. Yep. Um, and so you actually couldn't go to Gaza. Um, and, and this was movie was made several years ago and it was really the height of the conflicts um, that were happening, you know, literally every 24 months. So you really couldn't go there. And I had been to the West Bank so often that I felt really comfortable with Alex and, and, and the crew going there. Um, but even there, they, they had no permission. They just sort of went kind and of did it. But you couldn't do that. You couldn't go to Gaza. Excellent. So we had a question from uh, Sunny. When was the film actually made? What year? Yeah, so it was shot over a couple of years. We started in 2013. Um, and. 2013, 2014, um, over two different two different trips to Israel. Okay, excellent. And then uh, the, the 
And so we already saw the places that you most recommended, which were pretty neat, right? And were there any places you couldn't film or other than Gaza within Israel that just was more hands off? Yeah, and I mean, for the most part, we were uh, we didn't have a lot of permits, so we were we were in and out of a lot of places. But um, you know, a lot of the religious sites around Jerusalem, um, you know, we wanted to be extra sensitive around. And then there were only you know a couple restaurants that weren't comfortable with us filming. Um, other than that, everyone was in incredibly gracious and um, you know very very welcoming. So it was you know it was great, but it also helped. Uh, you know, to have sort of local scouts go ahead of time and sort of check it out and make sure they'd be okay with it. Um, right. So it was a good experience overall. Excellent. And a question just came up. Any hostility because you're, you're Jewish with regards to this project? You know, certainly, you know, a, a little bit. Once, you know, I started asking some of the hard questions, um, you know, people uh, would realize that I was trying to dig a little deeper than just, you know, what, you know, how you make your hummus. Right. Um, but, um, you know, really everyone was, was so honest oh. and upfront with me um, that, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't really have, you know, any incredibly uh, disrespectful or um, uncomfortable, you know, conversations. Um, it was, you know, everyone was very welcoming, thankfully. Excellent. And then uh, Bernice just asked a question. Can we still see the movie? How can we see it? Yeah, uh, definitely. I have a, I, I can share the, uh, the link to the, to Vimeo on it and it's just password protected. So I'm, I'm happy to, to send that along. That'd be great. Thank you. So obviously this portends to something else. What, what do you guys, what's next for you both? I mean, this was incredible. Uh, really neat. Um, but where do you envision taking this? What, falafel sequel, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, honestly, it, it, it started really as a, as a passion project and, you know, grew to something so much bigger. And, um, you know, I think we're so lucky to, to be able to show it to events like this and, you know, a lot of film festivals. Um, and so, you know, we're still talking to people about, you know, uh, potentially the best place for this. And, you know, there's a lot of um, you know, new streamers out there and, and kind of food centric places. So, um, you know, uh, so, you know, we're still having those discussions, but, um, you know, filmmaking, I'm, I sort of, in my career, I move more towards the production side. Um, but, you know, I always have, have the itch, uh, you know, in the back of my head. So maybe, maybe one day, uh, you know, we'll get back to, uh, to another documentary. Would it be fair to say that, I, and I'm just pulling this up, um, that you're a little ahead of your time because if you look at I know Netflix right um, and I believe it's Chef's Table, I mean you're, they they tell a story and you you were eight years ahead of them telling a story uh, about their cooking and and how it brings people together and and you did that way before anyone else did. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, it, it's funny. It's in incredibly popular now. Uh, Netflix is doing a great job among a lot of places that that sort of look at niche food around the world and the people behind it. Um, so you know, maybe maybe we should be thinking about a sequel right now, right now. I think you should. You you're way ahead of your time. And Rick, Dad, it would probably be a good investment for you. You know, just thinking financially, of course. But. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it was really neat. I mean, you, you're you're ahead of your time. You're eight years ahead, you know, nine, seven, eight years ahead of anyone else that was doing this. Pretty pretty incredible. Um, so we uh, Tom Rosenberg wants to get a direct link to it um, so we can show it to kids and family. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute. Well, anyone can unmute if they want. So anyone else that has any questions? Oh, Frankie does. Binky, go ahead, buddy. Um, okay, so we've got the Israeli restaurants. How about local, especially for the hummus and also the shawarma? Have we got any places in LA? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple. I actually just went to, uh, um, that, so there's a place in West Hollywood called Taim, T-A-E-E-M, um, Israeli owned and operated. Um, hummus is pretty good. The shawarma, schnitzels, excellent. Um, and then hummus bar um, uh, is is really good as well. I was just there on Friday. Um, 
but to be honest with you, it's pretty few and far between. Um, Whole Foods actually has really good hummus. Um, they're house-made hummus, but uh, there we go. Yeah, hummus bar in Encino. We should talk um, to Elliot. <laughs> Elliot. Uh, but there, I'm always taking hummus recommendations. Bar, isn't hummus bar a chain? Aren't there multiple locations? I think I there like are, yeah. Yeah, I think it. I think they have a couple of them. I think it, I think it's privately owned, but There's did you one guys? Go, Monica too. Did you guys go to Haifa? I saw that you talked about Haifa, or I yeah. believe, but I had some of the best hummus I've ever had in my life in Haifa. I I had friends that were there that were locals that took me there. I don't even know where I went. Amazing, yeah. We went to one restaurant, and uh, we actually went to a couple, but I featured one in Haifa that was amazing. Excellent. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me just talking into, oh, I you can't, okay. Because it, so many people are eating hummus, I have never seen where garbanzo beans are grown. Where, uh, where, where does all this come from? Well, the, um, the, the factory that I featured had them um, from Syria, ma mountains in Syria, but they're, um, you know, from all over the place, Lebanon, um, I believe Egypt. Um, so I think people get them from all over the region. And they make their own olive oil, obviously, in Israel and make their own olive oil. And one of the things that they told us was that one of the reasons it's better in Israel is because well, every product that goes into it is homegrown there. Whereas in the States or wherever, they're buying products and storing them for a long time so you don't have the same level of freshness. And then you're getting them from places very far away, whether you're talking about chickpeas or olive oil or whatever. Alex, we, we want to um, nicely uh, argue with you over the best hummus. Um, we, are, we love the hummus Saeed from Akko. Uh, $5 bought you all the hummus you could eat and all the fresh bread you could, and it was, I don't think we ate for three days after that. We loved it so much. Yeah. That's, in my, that's in my top two, actually. Yeah, it, it's hard to argue. It's a great restaurant. It's, it's a lively atmosphere. Anybody you ask, you know, where the best hummus and Akko is, they point you to the exact same place. It's in a wonderful little market. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to argue with that. We, we were excited when we saw it on the film. <laughs> also, one thing I don't, that um, they feed Israeli soldiers either for free or like a dollar, I, you know, hmm. uh, they, they don't charge soldiers at all. So you, you regularly see, you know, Israeli soldiers just pour into the place. <laughs> Alex, do you have connections to, this is Nicole speaking, do you still have connections to the people over in Israel? I want to start doing tours over there eventually when the world opens up. So I was wondering if you still have those connections. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I still talk to a bunch of people. Um, so I can, uh, maybe Doris can give you my email and we can. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. And, sure. and I've got some really good tour, tour guides as well in Israel. So I'm, I'm there every, every year, usually multiple times. Fantastic. I would love to connect. Thank you. Yeah, when we were in Akko, the person that took us around, took a very small group, was a friend of our daughter-in-law's dad. And he's university. a professor at the university, and mm -hmm. he's originally from England, so his English is impeccable. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we had a great time. He took us all over. That's great. So, Alex, one question I'm going to interject in. So what... And then we can continue this dialogue, of course, but what did you guys find, and, and, and to Rick both, most gratifying about your journey? So if you were able to back up at 30,000 feet, look back, granted from 2014, roughly when it's done, so it's been roughly seven years looking back, what would he say? Uh, Dad, you want to go first? Do you want me to go? Yeah, sure. I think um, what one of the um, restaurant owners said um, is what struck me the most and strikes me the most when I go there on a regular basis. And that is, um, and I go there to, for a lot of political things, but when you drop below that and you're just on the street, 
and taking people around and interacting with Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, Palestinians in the in East Jerusalem or or the West Bank. Um, most people are really nice, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and they just want to have good lives and um, they want everybody else to sort of fix the issues, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, just how welcoming everybody really is. Um, and and um, I mean, I take groups there um, without any agenda and just just so they can experience things on the ground. Yeah. Uh, and and some of them aren't Jewish and they've never been there before. And they come away feeling it's nothing like what they thought or what they heard of because people just want, people just want to get along. Yeah, I, I mean, I would echo that. And, um, you know, just say that, you know, I, I, I'm sure everyone has experienced this when you bring someone to, a, you know, on a trip to Israel who've never been before um, you know, they just have a, a life-changing experience for the better. Um, and it happened with, a, a, you know, a couple people from my crew. And, and since then, I've gone to Israel and, and brought friends and showed them around. Um, and it's just an amazing sort of thing that, that happens to people. What they, you know, what they think about it before and after is, is totally different. Um, and I would just say, you know, when you are on the ground, just going, you know, walking on the streets and going to restaurants, you really do just meet people for as they are. Um, and you just realize that there are a lot more uh, commonalities between us, um, you know, than differences. And, um, you know, at least in the restaurants, you know, everyone was able to focus on those commonalities for, for, for at least a little bit. I have to agree with you on that. I traveled there as a solo female. I travel a lot alone and I've never met such friendly people other than Australia. So I, unfortunately, the media paints a picture of Israel and the Gaza and all that. And yes, there is bombings and stuff and you have to be careful, but it's such a friendly country and everybody just wants to welcome you. So as we start to wind this down, Alex and Rick, so you obviously you had a purpose for doing this. What would be your goal or what would be your, your mantra? What would you want your audience to get out of it, right? So if they were either in Israel or traveling the world or even at home, what would you want them to be better as a result of watching your work? Which by the way, was phenomenal work. Um, I would say twofold. If you're in Israel, um, be open to another suggestion and try a hummus place you've never had before. Um, I would say if, if you're not in Israel, go there if you can. Um, if not, venture out of your comfort zone. Um, if it's to a restaurant or, or whatever else and, and, you know, and try something new. Um, you know, I, I was certainly nervous to get out of my comfort zone when filming the, the movie, but, um, and, you know, very grateful that, that I did. Um, and so even if it's at a local level, um, you know, I hope people, you know, are able to do that. Rick, you know, I would just, I would just add that, um, I mean, it's hard if you're just going for the first time because everybody wants to go see the famous stuff. Right. Um, but to the extent that um, whether you're on your own or with friends or a tour guide, um, you make a point of doing all the cultural stuff. It's the cultural stuff that you're gonna see all the interaction between everybody everybody there, you know, different ethnicities and religions and all that. And that's where you'll get a much better feel for what Israel really is like. Um, on the ground. Excellent. Thank you. So I will turn it over to anyone. Any other questions for Alex or Rick? Excellent. Well, I want to say thank you to Doris. Um, she literally is the, the <laughs> she runs the show. So I want to th just, uh, uh, if we could, in, in, in a couple of minutes before we turn over the lawn, give a big clap out to Doris. You, you're awesome. You rock. You, you, you're everything. So thank you, Doris. You're just phenomenal. I, I just want to add, um, when I visited my son who studied at the Hebrew University, he always sent me to a place called Ha'achim, which was near, there was one near the Tel Aviv bus station and one near the Haifa bus station um, for hummus and falafel. But I think... Um, my favorite has been in Abu Ghosh and we went there after seeing your movie. So love that one. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah. Alex can send the link to Doris might be the easiest thing to do. Let's and do that and we'll distribute it. So thank you. Yeah. To everyone. And we look forward to your next venture. So please keep us yeah. uh, posted. <laughs> I have a feeling that uh, it, it will be huge. And thank you both, uh, Alex and Rick. You guys are awesome. And as Leanne said it best, it's just gratitude. So thank you so much for everything you guys did. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And so thank you again. And uh, without further ado, then Alon, the floor is yours, buddy. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Alex and Rick, uh, so much for sharing your film and sharing your passion, which is, uh, which is really what life is about. If we, uh, if we could all just share our passions with each other, then, uh, then, then the world would be a much better place as long as we could appreciate each other's passions. So, um, so thank you so much. I have to tell you, I was so happy to see Dr. Shakshuka on there, one of my favorite restaurants in <laughs> all of Yavo. Um, Love to go there. Love to also go to the Old Man in the Sea in the old in the old city of Yaffa. Great, great restaurant as well. Lots of great places to eat. And uh, and hey, folks, hopefully summer of 2022. Come with me, and we'll uh, and we'll plan another fantastic Temple Beth El trip to to Israel. That's that's hopefully going to be the plan. Please God, I'm ready. Let's open up. The, let's open up the traps. We'll be there. Exactly. Excellent. I love it. I love it. All right, so I get the honor of introducing the man who needs no introduction. And um, when we started talking about this program uh, on in the in the Mensch Club committee, you know, every program that we do, we also make sure that we spotlight uh, one of our Mensch Club members as kind of a, a journey story. And um, and as we were talking about hummus, I only know one other person besides Alex now, I only know one other person who has ever traveled all the way throughout Israel to try to find the best hummus. The difference is, is that he did it because he was trying to recreate it here in the United States. And, um, and that is my very, very dear friend. Many of us say my best friend because he really probably is. <laughs> I, oh, you shush over here. So <laughs> my very, very best friend, um, Elliot Swartz, who is our journey speaker tonight. I could tell you all about him, but why would I do that when I know that he spent the last like three weeks preparing to tell us about himself? Um, so, <laughs> which is something he's not really comfortable doing. <laughs> something he's not really comfortable doing. So, but, uh, but I'm going to bring him into the spotlight here. And Elliot, there you are. Are. Hi. How hey. are you? Did you have hummus tonight? Uh, not tonight. I think we drop it off. <laughs> ah, ah, I know. I'm going to be making some in the next couple of days. I promise, because uh, I'm I have to do it. I have to do it. So, Elliot, welcome, and the floor is yours. I'm going to end my spotlight so we can just look at your cute punim. Here right. we go. <laughs> so that was an incredible story on hummus in Israel. So if you have not been to Israel uh, and that doesn't do it for you, I don't know what else will, because that is fantastic. Um, 25 years ago, hummus would change my life at, <clears throat> as a well-known grocery chain with a cult following in California, which will be nameless, asked our business broker if we wanted to participate in sending hummus samples. We said, sure. Our R&D chef, Terry, who now with her husband, George, owns the cooking school, Chef Tech in Long Beach, was given the task to make the best tasting hummus we had ever had. And just like that, we were in the hummus business. Back then, our customer had 72 locations, and today they have over 500. We started out making 70 pounds at a time, and ended up with 20,000 pounds a day. And that's what you call a lot of beans. <laughs> Gail and I visited Israel with Rabbi Chuck on a TBE trip. Everywhere we went, we had to try hummus. At one of the most famous places, which was Abu Shukri, which was in the, in the, in the movie, we met the owner and we explained, I made hummus in the United States. He was so excited that I love his hummus, he brought us back into the kitchen to show us his buckets of beans in various stages of production. 
We developed a similar hummus when I got back to the States, even purchasing a depositor from Israel where it not only filled the deli cups, but would drop pine nuts in the middle, spray olive oil on top, and deposit a ring of spices. It became the number one selling hummus at our client's stores. And that's my hummus story. Sure. I grew up in the suburbs of Boston with my mom, Sylvia, dad, Herbert, and my two brothers, Bill, who was 10 years older than me, Joe, who was 16 months younger, and my sister, Janice, five years older. Joe and I spent hours tag team wrestling against Bill, but never seemed to win, even when we both jumped on him together. Janice always wanted to be a school teacher and Joe and I would play endless hours of school with our three cousins. My mom was an exceptional cook and we were definitely spoiled. Supper was on the table at 6 p.m. six nights a week. Every Sunday was our day for deli, which gave my mom a break from cooking. My love for food came from the great dishes my mom prepared, but my passion for cooking came from my dad. My dad was also an amazing drummer and he had a band for many years before I was born. He gave up the band and went to work for his dad in the floor sanding business, which he didn't like very much. Part-time, he would work at delis and he loved it. His dream became a reality when he opened a luncheonette with 30 stools in downtown Boston. That's when I had my first experience at the age of 12 to cook on the weekends at the Checker Smoker, a name because the other side of the business was a smoke shop. I learned to cook short order and then waited on customers which resulted in some handsome tips from my regulars. This was my calling, my dad said. Soon I was taking a bus, a trolley, and a train to business to the business after school. I would get my homework done and then work until closing. Sometimes my sister and mom would join us. Eventually we changed locations and the name became Checkerboard Deli. While I was in high school, I took a home ec class. My teacher said that her husband was a chef at a convalescent hospital and, and would I like to go for the day to see how large production was done. It was amazing. She asked me, what are you gonna do when you graduate? And have you given any thought to go into chef school? What? Chef school? There's a school for chefs? No way. Actually, there were two schools in the entire country. My dad had, and I visited both schools, but I knew it had to be the Culinary Institute of America in High Park, New York. I was accepted and couldn't wait to start. My mom had been ill. She had what was called the big C, cancer. I don't remember using that word much, but we all knew it wasn't good. She had taken a turn for the worse. I decided I couldn't leave and would put off school. I notified the school and that I would contact them when I could start. It wasn't too much time after that, the phone rang. And the person on the other end from the hospital told my 16-year-old brother, Joe, that my mom had died. He came and told me, 30 minutes later, my dad came home. And I needed to do what to this day was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And tell my dad and my mom had passed away. I have spent the past two years praying to God that my mom would get better. I was very angry and stopped talking to God so many years later, and I found Temple Bethel. It was a couple of months before I graduated high school, and I was devastated that my mom would not be with me, but I knew in my heart she was watching. I was 17 and was looking forward to starting a cooking school. I called and let them know I was ready. Unfortunately, they were not. They said I had my chance, and there was a huge waiting list. I called weekly to try to change their minds. No was not an option. Finally, they said, we want six letters of reference from only people in the food industry while you should get a second chance. 
Oh. I got them. And finally, I had a date to start. But I asked to be at the commencement speaker in 2013. I weave that story into my talk. <laughs> it was an amazing, amazing experience. I was, I was looking forward to graduation. Unfortunately, a couple of months before I graduated, my dad had a heart attack and passed away. Once again, I felt angry. I needed to get away and start over. I, I had been seeing a fellow student that later I would marry, but first Lori would go to Atlanta to work and I decided to head to California with two classmates who had jobs at the 94th Aero Squadron in Torrance, who said, come along, I am sure we can get you a job too. I had $1,400 to my name, which I received selling my car. So off to LA, we went, me with no car and very little money. I became the sous chef. During the next few years, I would work for various restaurants, including the Playboy Club, which was a fun job, which I cooked for many celebrities. I worked at Reef Gauche and Mount Cole with Mr. Wonderful Grant Perry. Tally Ho and Cerritos was my first opportunity to be the executive chef with all the responsibilities to go with the title. I asked Lori if she wanted to come from L to LA from Atlanta, but she was doing very well and live with me and be my sous chef. She was all for coming to LA and starting to life together, but didn't know if she wanted to work for me. I said, it's both or nothing. And she said, okay, let's do it. I later ended up going back to Reef Gauche and Lori took various positions. Neither of us were all that happy at work and Lori's parents told us they would buy us a house if we moved to Chicago. I had grown up in Boston and wasn't looking forward to winters again. So we kept going back and forth, move, don't move, move, don't move. Lori had an interview at a new restaurant called Chez Melange. She had to audition at a pre-opening banquet that Robert Bell would make his decision to hire her or not. I said, it's a sign. If you get the job, we stay. If not, we buy ice scrapers and go to Chicago. She started as sous chef and making desserts. Desserts became very popular and she couldn't do both positions. Robert asked Lori to ask me if I would be interested in working as his sous chef. I interviewed and immediately got the job. The restaurant was a huge success with long, a long wait every day of the week. Eventually, Robert and Michael asked us if we wanted to open a bakery together. We would work for Sweat Equity. They would front the cash. Unfortunately, they were cash poor as the restaurant was growing Growing, this went on for three years. I told Lori, we need to start our own business. Lori never wanted to start a business, but agreed. We first could go to Europe to educate ourselves, what we learned at school, and taste the food and desserts from where they were first created. We went for four months in 11 countries, spending almost all of our money on eating and very little as possible on pensions. When I returned home, I went back to work at Chez Melange, where Lori started two chefs on a roll, making desserts for restaurants. With $7,000 we had saved. Now I could spend endless hours on the 23 years it took to go from a company with no employees, very little startup, to 300 employees and a business that grew to annual sales of $40 million. But that's not gonna happen tonight. There is one special vendor that stands out more than any other. It helped us reach our dreams. That is allied sales and distribution. Larry Nevins in his memory before blessing and his son, my dear friend, Greg Nevins, both incredible human beings who believed in us and throughout the years supported us like no other. 
Murray and I loved the business. It was our baby. We grew it to a stronger doubt. We came to realize that we were better business partners than husband and wife. We separated in 1995 and later divorced, but continued to grow the business until 2008 when we sold it. We are still good friends today. I remained working in the business until 2010, then started a consulting company helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses. I volunteered my services at the South Bay Entrepreneurial Center and continue with that work. I consider myself very fortunate to meet monthly with an incredible group of business leaders led by our chair of Vistage, Yolanda Guybert. I was nominated to join the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism Board of Directors, and served 10 years in various positions. Both Gail and I have served on the URJ Camp Newman Advisory Board for over 14 years. <clears throat> One of the many ways I've been blessed is through the 24 years I have been a member of Temple Beth Al. I have served in many leadership roles, including three years as president and 10 years as a trustee. I was proud to serve on the Dhamma Committee, continue serving today. We made 8,000 humantashi each year at the bakery for 11 straight years for our incredible sisterhood. Or the many. You're okay, go ahead. It's not the positions that I have held or the many committees I have served on, but the friendships that stand out for me. The people who I call my friends who are more like family and enriched my life far beyond anything I could have imagined. When I walked through those temple doors on a quest to convince a woman I barely knew who was singing in the choir to go out with me one more time, you see, in 1997, my life would change for the better as I met the woman that I would fall in love with and eventually marry and have a life filled with family, friends, and lots of love. We met on a blind date set up in, in a Jewish chat room on AOL. Gail is smart, pretty, sexy, and fun to be with. We instantly felt a strong chemistry and it has only grown throughout these years. I don't know where I would be if we hadn't met. The joy of our daughter, Rebecca, who I adopted, and BJ, who I love like a son. Family has always been important to me, but I had lost hope that I would someday be a dad. I am so very proud of Rebecca and BJ. They both have chosen incredible people to share their lives with. Erica and BJ recently purchased their first home and our grandchildren, Dahlia and Joelle, give us so much pleasure spoiling them whenever we can. Rebecca and Oscar will be married later this year. They're working towards building their careers and hopefully some grandchildren in the near future. There are so many people and stories who have made my life so much better. We could be here for many more hours. They know who they are, and I want you to know I love each of you and look forward to creating new stories and memories. I want to tell you <clears throat> of just one more story that made a huge difference in my life. Many years ago, Lori and I, Lori had a friend who had leukemia in high school. Joan was in remission and wanted to be an actress. She asked us if she could come to Chicago and work and live with us while she got on her feet. We agreed. Joe stayed with us for quite a while. During that time, she shared she would like to volunteer at a hospital and give back for all she had received. Joan never got that chance as she passed away at the age of 32. In her honor, I decided to volunteer at Toronto Memorial for a year. That turned into 10 years in the ER. 
where I met one of my most dearest friends, Jody, who was also a volunteer. We would go out for dinner after our shift and just spend time talking about life. She was always trying to gain weight and I was always trying to lose weight. Gail and I had the opportunity to put Alon and Jordy together on a blind double date. And Jordy, Jordan and Zoe have never stopped saying, blame Elliot. I love the Davidson family and wish Jordan a very happy 18th birthday today. This past year, Gail and I said goodbye to two very special people in our lives, Papa and Grammy. Gail's parents always treated me like a son. I loved them dearly. During this time when we were not able to hug and hold them, it fills my heart to know my parents are with them now and they were surely hugged, held, and loved. Someday, we will all be together. Thank you. Gail has helped me to put together a few pictures of my life, and I'd like to share that with you. Now she's gonna take over. <laughs> Okay, she's working on it. It worked before. I was just going to check in with you guys, make sure it was working. Yeah, she's working on it. Oh, shame. You're doing great, Gailey. <laughs> we love you. We love you. Just so you know, there's supposed to be music with this, but now I can talk. That's when I worked at Playboy. That's a big muscle. Time to sleep. My sister and I, the World Series. Can you believe how long ago I got Foyer the month? Here's Jody. <laughs> I'm glad it froze there. You look great, babe. <laughs> By the way, Elliot, the music is playing. Oh, it is? Yeah. It was, yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. We don't have it over here. Maybe you should sing for everyone. Yeah, I think we have a Close the night when I start singing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, okay, let's go try. There you go. Okay. Oh, Grammy. <laughs> My friend, Grammy. I loved your dad at the top of that, so it's kind of fun. It's frozen on the hat. Exactly. You look great there, Greg. <laughs> Try it again. Greg. BJ. This is the Camp Newman. Wedding. My cousin Mitch. <laughs> Michael Strahan. Stacy and Stefan. Family back east. Joelle. Playing. I was going to Rebecca helping me cook. Barbara Bell. Hey, My talk at the school. Okay, that was it. We got oh any questions? Where are the golf pictures? <laughs> uh, I don't show it until I get better. <laughs> yeah. When's dessert, Elliot? <laughs> yeah. Come on over. All right, we're on our way. Well, if there's if there's no other questions for Elliot, I just want to say, you know, um, uh, it's it's funny because you noticed earlier when I was introducing Elliot that like introducing him as my best friend is a very strange thing because there's the family that you're born into, and there's the family that you adopt into your lives. And Elliot is not my best friend; he's my brother, and. Um, and uh, as you can see, our families are very intermingled. And uh, when when we talk about family get-togethers, it's it's always a combo deal. So the Swartzes and the Davidsons and the extended families on both sides. And uh, and Elliot, your life is so amazing, and um, and and it is evident in everything that you do that everything about your life is about your heart. And, um, and your heart is one of the most generous, one of the most loving, and one of the most fun hearts that I know in my life and that many of us know in our lives. And um, went to Randolph High School, Gail says. All right. <laughs> Can I say something? What was that? I want to know if I can thank Doris for... Uh... Uh, Seattle Bench Club. I think I'm going to join. I had such a great. I had such a great time. I think uh, you're outdoing the sisterhood. 
Well, you're all oh, welcome. Oh, now Elaine. Elaine, this is not a competition. Let's not, not a competition, here. but we will talk about other <laughs> no, best club I... events coming up in a minute. It's not <laughs> a competition. <laughs> Anyways, I do want to, I just want to thank, I want to thank Elliot so much for sharing about yourself. Um, I still remember very clearly that trip to Israel when you came back and said, I think I got it. I think I got the best hummus recipe that, that, that I can possibly make. I'm going to work on it right away. And then you came over and you're like, taste this. <laughs> How does this taste? Does it taste like home? And, um, and it does. And every single time I eat that hummus to this day, I, I still just feel like if I if I have to buy a hummus in this country that is not homemade by myself, it it's it's the only way to go. So your hummus is is uh, is the best in all of the United States, as far as I'm concerned, and um, and uh, and I know that uh, we'll have to ship some over to Alex and his dad so they can try it. <laughs> in case <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, again, I want to say a big thank you to uh, to Alex and Rick. I want to thank Doris and Jamie um, for your incredible leadership and and uh, and George. I know he's on here somewhere. I just don't see his picture on here right now. But um, to everyone that's here, you know, Elaine, you put it so well. Because uh, you know, you said you want to join the Mensch Club, and the reality is, the reality is, is that we want everyone at Temple Bethel to want to join the Mensch Club, to want to join the Sisterhood. By the way, I will mention that Elliot and I are the only two male members of the Temple Bethel Sisterhood as well, and um, you know, it's something that we. That's have. right. That's right. Exactly. Because I, every every time I think of, I'm sorry, of Israel. I think of our trip when Norman went with us and he loved the shawarma, but he didn't live long enough to eat the hummus. Oh no. Yeah. So we do have some, but we do have some um, closing stuff if it's okay, I, I will jump in a little bit. Take it, Jamie, take Absolutely. it away. Well, first of all, Elliot, awesome work. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I met you uh, was when uh, Rabbi Chuck was like, hey, we're doing a music in someone's house to show up to the street and pay a couple bucks and then next you know you're in a grassy knoll and I'm sitting next to Rabbi Chuck who's got an Alaska beer hat sitting in a lounge chair and I'm like where am I and the next year I'm going to check out a man cave with some really cool massage chair and all these sports <laughs> well, I need that dog, right now. I go I go this this guy is stellar and and, and I'm going to mess with you Marvin and you got Wayne Gretzky on the side over there because he does look just like Wayne Gretzky uh, you got some memorabilia of him and everything else so so I just want to thank everyone. Um, we have a lot of great things. So just a couple of closing things and we're going to open up the chat. So those who want to stay in chat can absolutely do that. But a couple of things we do want to close with um, as part of our normal customary thing. So one thing we're really proud of with the Mensch Club is our mentoring capability. Um, so for those of you who have a grandkid, a, a friend or someone that's looking for either career advice, um, career help, right? Or anything, pathing, um, we looked on the screen one day, not too long ago, and we were like, man, we got a lot of, a lot of JDs, MDs, entrepreneurs, real estate, a lot of uh, educational folks, we got a lot of smart people on this, on this screen. Let's use this talent, me excluded, but those people on it, let's use that talent and let's try to better the, the congregation. So if you know of anybody, you can either re reach out to Rabbi Cassie if they're a little more concerned about reaching out or reach out to me directly. So it's up to you. We will triage it. We'll take care of it. And, 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 and I can promise you uh, they will get a better response out of it. So that's number one. So just keep in the back of your head. Anyone that wants mentoring, career advice, anything like that, reach out to us. Number one. Number two, our next event will be in May. Uh, I highly recommend watching the docu uh, documentary through Nancy Spielberg called Above and Beyond. It is a phenomenal documentary, and we're making some serious inroads with a, a professor out of Harvard that is willing to, or not willing, would love to have the opportunity to speak with us about said uh, is American involvement in the Israeli 1948 war, but more importantly, propping up Israel as a whole. So we got we got a lot of great. Uh, um, what I'm trying to say is we have a lot of great material still to come. And it's not about, to your point, it's not about Mensch Club, Elaine, or Sisterhood. It's about the temple. 
So we're working on coordinating calendars and themes and all that. So we're all marching to the same tune of what it is we want to do. Additionally, the only way- If, it, if it wasn't for the temple, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> well, if it wasn't for, uh, uh, where's Ray Murphy? She better be on this or I'm gonna, I'm gonna drive down to her house and yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't for Ray Murphy, I wouldn't be on here either. So that's a whole different discussion. But, uh, and the other one is we're gonna do, we wanna know if you, can't, if you can't inspect what we're doing, then we can't get better. And the idea is we always wanna get better. So after this uh, men's club tonight, you will get a survey. Please let us know. It's real easy. It's not too, it's not survey monkey. It's real easy to just reply back. What do you like and what do you want to see better as a result of what we're trying to do? Because we're only going to get better by, by hearing your voices and what we can do better and differently, knowing that, hey, we're all in this together. And so what does that look like today? And what will that look like tomorrow? Uh, and so the men will get the survey. And then after that, uh, we'll distribute it accordingly. But um, the idea is, we definitely want to hear your voices. What can we do better? Um, so again, just to reiterate, we've got a really good mentoring program. It's in the infancy stage. It's going to get legs and we'll all be proud of the work that we do. That's number one. Number two, the content we're trying to deliver both on Zoom and ultimately one day in person, thank God, uh, will be phenomenal as well. Completely inclusive. Of everybody on the screen and anyone we know is absolutely invited to it. And then lastly, um, how are we doing and what we do better? So without further ado, Doris, I'm going to turn it over to you with regards to breaking up into groups. And uh, I just want to thank everybody. And uh, again, Alex and Rick and uh, Elliot and Gail uh, for all the work you guys have done. It's a team effort. Elliot, you're awesome. Gail, you're awesome. Uh, Alon, you're not too shabby yourself either. And, uh, and, and thank you all for just a, a great evening. So. Doris, without further ado, it's you. Thank you to everybody for joining us, Alex and Rick. Thank you. The, the film is wonderful. Elliot, thank you so much. It was wonderful to hear your journey and your story. Um, we're just going to leave the um, screens open for a while. If anybody wants to chat and, and, and stay together and have a little conversation, um, Please do, please do. Please and as gallery mode and just open up the gallery talk and, and, and see what on the screen and say hi to everybody. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our next event. I'm gonna stop the recording by the way. Yeah, Good. now we can stop the recording. <laughs>